57-year-old Barry Crane was a prolific producer and director who was involved in famous programs in the 60s and 70s, like Mission Impossible and The Incredible Hulk. He was also a professional bridge player and was in Studio City, Los Angeles on July 5, 1985 for a bridge regional tournament. But little did he know that the games he had played that week would be the final games of his life. On the evening of that day, his bare body was found by a housekeeper in the garage of his luxurious townhome in Studio City, beaten and strangled with a telephone cord. What could have happened to the renowned producer? Was this a vengeful murder or something more complicated? Welcome back to Cold Case Files, where we bring you the stories of the most notorious cold cases in history. Today we are walking through the 34-year-long cold case of Barry Crane, which was finally solved in 2019. Before starting, we would like you to take a minute of your time to hit the like and subscribe button. Also press the bell icon to be the first to discover all the new cold cases. Now without wasting any more time, let's jump in to this twisted cold case. To the west of the famous Hollywood Hills lies the Studio City of Los Angeles, originally known as Laurelwood. Studio City is a very sophisticated and luxurious place, and living in this city was like a dream come true for many stars. Studio City is known for its costly mansions and celebrity residence. Many famous Hollywood actors and celebrities, like Bruno Mars, George Clooney, Will Smith, and Tom Cruise live here. The crime rates in Studio City are 28% higher than the national average, but the violent crimes are 33% lower than that of the nation. This city was not supposed to be the deathbed of an energetic producer, but unfortunately, this is the place where a dreadful homicide took place in 1985. But first, we go back to the beginning, when Barry J. Cohen was born in Detroit, Michigan on November 10, 1927, to the family of Lois Lou Cohen and Sylvia Cohen. He had one sibling, Elliot David Cohen, and he was the younger of the two brothers. From a young age, the brothers spent a great deal of time with their father, who was a well-rounded man with varied interests. Their father-son bond became even stronger when the boys started learning to play the game of bridge from their father. Since his childhood, Barry was exposed to the entertainment business when he saw his father's business of movie theaters. His father Lou was the owner of many theaters and worked on civic projects while also continuing to play the game of bridge. Barry Crane got married to Arlene Anderson from Los Angeles in 1944, when he was just 17 years old. But it did not take long before the relationship fell apart. After two years in 1946, he got married again to Shirley Coblin of Southfield, Michigan. He had two children in his second marriage, Sherilyn and Ben. Barry was 20 years old and was attending the University of Michigan when his father Lou passed away in 1947 at the age of 53. The death of his father devastated him and he dropped out of college. Unlike the successful professional life he was soon going to have, his personal life wasn't at its peak. The second marriage did not last long too and in 1954, he got divorced for the second time. Barry, after failing in both of his marriages, wanted to change his life completely. He was looking for a fresh start and changed his surname from Cohen to Crane for professional reasons. In 1955, Barry moved to Los Angeles, California, with the aspiration of turning his life into something successful. Barry really needed a change in his life and soon his hopes were about to become true. He first worked in the Pasadena Playhouse, which is a venue for performing arts. He started his career in television entertainment, 
and shopped an original screenplay that became part of the three-picture deal between RKO Pictures and King Brothers. The title of the script was The Seven Lanterns of Japan, described as The Asphalt Jungle, a 1950 film noir directed by John Huston, with a Japanese setting. The film was not made, but that was the starting point Barry needed in the industry. He was the associate producer, and later on, the producer of a 1966 TV series called Mission Impossible. He also produced Mannix in 1967, The Magician in 1973, and many more. He was also credited with directing Trapper John M.D., The Incredible Hulk, Hawaii Five-0, Chips, Dallas, Wonder Woman, and Super Train. Barry soon became famous among the movie stars and was appreciated by many of them. One of the actors whom Barry had worked with, Mike Connors, described him as a problem solver and said that Barry was very talented. It was not long before Barry started getting recognized for his job in his career. He made some important connections, which helped him to be a part of some of the most influential series of the 1960s and 1970s. Although Barry was beginning to become famous for his dedication to his work and was becoming well-known among fans and co-workers, information on Barry's personal lifestyle was very scant, and he was great at deflecting questions. A rumor started about Barry's sexuality when he moved to L.A. However, Barry deflected questions like he usually did when asked about it. During those years, being a homosexual man was like being a witch in the Dark Ages, and Barry knew that very well. Although he wasn't vocal about it, he never denied any rumors of him being homosexual. He surely was looking to adjust somewhere in the big city, looking for a place where he could have some freedom following his choice of lifestyle. Even though Barry was very focused on his work, his mind was not at ease. When he was interviewed in 1972, he explained that he was married twice, but both marriages ended in divorce, and that didn't let him relax. He continued saying that in February he went on a vacation to the Caribbean, which was supposed to last three weeks, but he could only stand it for five days, and he concluded by saying that his mind was overactive and barely let him rest. Apart from being quite successful in the movie line, Barry was also an excellent bridge player. He liked playing the cards from a young age and started his professional career from the late 1940s. While being an important character in the TV industry, Barry's interest for bridge never stopped. Playing bridge competitively became his weekend job. He often played with Peter Graves, an actor between scenes. It should be noted that he won the prestigious McKenney Award, named after American contract Bridge League Executive Secretary William McKenney at the age of 25. This award was given to the player in North America who accumulated the most master points in tournament play in a calendar year, and Barry Crane dominated this competition for 30 years, either challenging or winning most of them. In his lifetime, he won the McKenney Trophy six times, in 1952, 1967, 1971, 1973, 1975, and 1978. He also won the Mott Smith Trophy twice, the Oscar Trophy four times, the Stoddard Memorial Trophy once, and the IBPA Award for the Best Personality in the year 1985. Barry Crane was even the 15-time North American champion and a Grand Life Master in the ACBL. Throughout his career, Barry won many other awards and earned tremendous respect as a bridge player. He had the record of highest master points in bridge history even after his death in 1985. It was only in 1991 that his record was broken by Paul Soloway. In honor and memorial of Barry Crane, the American Contract Bridge League, also known as ACBL, renamed the award given for the highest bridge master points in a year, 
to the Barry Crane Trophy. Ten years after his death, in 1995, Barry was inducted to the ACBL Hall of Fame. Barry was a friendly person and was often praised by his co-workers in the TV line and also in his bridge career. One person known to be close to him was his bridge partner, Carrie Schumann, with whom he won the World Mixed Pair title in 1978 for a bridge competition held in New Orleans. His aggressive gameplay and Carrie's strategic defense made them one of the best teams in the history of the game. Barry's iconic TV series from the 1960s and 70s made him a star producer and director. His luxurious house in Studio City and his white Cadillac El Dorado was proof of how successful he was becoming in Hollywood. Some of his last works were in the early 80s, including directing episodes of Flamingo Road, Seven Bridges for Seven Brothers, The Powers of Matthew Starr, and a movie, Conquest of the Earth, the third and final chapter of the Battlestar Galactica trilogy. It was the month of July in 1985, and Barry was in Pasadena for a Bridge Week regional tournament being held in the Pasadena Convention Center, California. He was part of a four-person team, poised to win the tournament. He also played a two-session pair game with Billy Miller, a Silver Life Master and a Bridge Bulletin columnist. It was the 4th of July, a Thursday, and Barry invited Miller and his ex-wife to a dinner at a restaurant nearby. They accompanied Barry in his car, but when they reached there, he excused himself saying that he wasn't feeling well. Before leaving, Barry was seen making a phone call. It was July 5th, 1985, and his team was waiting at the tournament center, but Barry was absent. Although his absence created a murmur among the players, Carrie Schumann, Barry's favorite teammate, took his place and played the game in his stead. While Barry's team was dominating the tournament, he was in his home, which was located in the 4200 block of Colfax Avenue, relaxing on his holiday Friday, or that was what everyone had thought. Thursday might have gone as usual, but what happened on the early morning of Friday was unexpected. In the afternoon of July 5th, a Friday, the regular housekeeper for Barry's home reached his place before 3 p.m. and went to the second level of the house through the front door, but Barry was nowhere to be seen. She saw a blood trail leading up to the third floor bedroom, and she followed it. She reached the bedroom, but Barry was not there. There was evidence of a struggle in there, and she noticed that some bedsheets were missing. There was blood splattered all over the apartment, and she saw a broken ceramic statue on the ground which was covered in blood. She immediately started looking for the owner of the house, and finally reached the garage on the lowest level. What she found was a sight she could not forget. Barry's bludgeoned body was lying on the ground, his head having been repeatedly beaten, seemingly by the ceramic statue. His neck was strangled with a telephone cord. His naked body was wrapped in bedsheets, and his wallet and the 1984 Cadillac Eldorado was missing. This was reported to the police immediately. Barry's team won the finals the next day on July 6th, but Barry wasn't there to witness another great win on that Saturday. The news of his death had already created a panic in the tournament, but the tournament had to go on. In the end, Carey led the team to victory. It seemed like a perfect tribute to Barry, and the players gathered for the tournament applauded loudly to honor Barry Crane. After witnessing the crime scene and the bloodstains, the police believed that Barry was killed in his apartment and then dragged from the third floor bedroom to the garage. They considered that the killer could have been someone with whom Barry had some unresolved issues. The L.A. County Coroner's Office completed Barry's autopsy not long after the day of the incident. It was concluded that Barry died of blunt force trauma to the head. The investigators pursued the case 
and a few days later on July 10th, Barry's stolen white Cadillac was found near Los Padres National Park to the west of Gormantown on Interstate 5 on a mountain road 60 miles away from the crime scene. The detectives also went to the bridge tournament and collected DNA samples from the players who had been in contact with Barry. They were asked to provide samples of hair, fingerprints, and blood for the DNA report. According to Dennis Sorensen, an accomplished bridge player, the interrogation was quite exhaustive. Some cigarette buds were found in the car, along with some blood samples. Using the help of forensics, some tests were done on the DNA collected from the cigarette buds. Five of the buds had a different DNA sample than that of Barry. The DNA was collected and they also took a fingerprint, which they believed might have belonged to the suspect. It seemed that the case would close very soon, and the suspect would be found, but that was not what happened. Even after the DNA was found, matching it to a person was a very difficult task for the investigators. The search continued for many years, but to no avail. The police interrogated many people in and around the area, but arrested no one, and not even a suspect was found. They interrogated people, but very little information was gathered from them. The case slowly faded after 1986 and remained a mystery, eventually turning cold. The sudden death of Barry Crane sent a wave of shock through the hearts of many bridge players who were in the city for ongoing bridge competitions. As a first-class bridge player, Barry's death was heartbreaking in the whole bridge community. The L.A. Police Department started interrogating the players who were in Pasadena for the competition and had seen Barry or known him. The entry slips that had been filled out by the tournament players were taken in as evidence, but no one was accused or taken into custody. Barry's partner, Carrie Schumann, was heartbroken, and she couldn't believe that Barry would be a victim of homicide. She had no clue who could have done something like that to Barry, but she was definitely in the hope that the case would be solved quickly. According to L.A. Police Lieutenant Ron LaRue, Barry's home was not ransacked, and there was no evidence of forced entry. He believed that Barry must have known the killer and let him into his apartment by will. In the year 2006, a Los Angeles Police Department detective from Robbery Homicide Division, RHD, requested that evidence, including fingerprints, be retested. The retest was done, but to no avail. The case still remained unsolved and two decades had already passed. The search for the suspect continued, but the police and the investigators found no clue that could lead them to the solution. Later in 2018, the RHD requested to test the fingerprint and other evidence gathered once again. After an attempt in July of 2018, RHD received a forensic match to Barry's suspected killer. Through the means of social media, and by serving search warrants on Facebook and Verizon, the police were finally able to find and locate the suspect, Edwin Hyatt, who was working in a car repair shop in Burke County, North Carolina, and was living in a camper van. It was obviously difficult to connect the evidence to Hyatt, as he was living about 3,000 miles away from the place of the incident. After locating Hyatt, the FBI was on constant alert and looking for a chance to collect Hyatt's DNA sample without his knowledge. It was finally possible when Hyatt stopped in a parking lot near his car repair center and drank a cup of coffee and smoked some cigarettes. An FBI surveillance team took the disposable coffee cup and discarded cigarette butts without Mr. Hyatt's knowledge, according to court documents. These were then sent for testing and by January 19th, the police finally got the DNA match. Edwin Jerry Hyatt was born in 1967 and grew up in North Carolina. Hyatt, from a very young age, showed signs of delinquency and indulged himself in drugs. 
The murder of Barry Crane was not the only accusation that Hyatt was charged for. Even before his arrest for the 34-year-old cold case of Barry Crane, he had faced a charge for stealing a vehicle. He was caught with a stolen car in Utah in 1985, in the same year of Barry Crane's homicide. In 1997, Hyatt was charged with domestic violence. A witness told the court that Hyatt had beaten and choked his wife till she vomited. That was when Hyatt's fingerprints were uploaded to the police database. After he was found guilty, Hyatt got a divorce. That's not where Hyatt stopped. He apparently threatened to burn down the house where his ex-wife lived. In 2013, Hyatt moved to Connolly Springs, and he started working for Turning Leaf Tree Service until he had an accident. And in 2014, he started volunteering at the Oat Sweet and Creek Assisted Living Center. Later in 2018, according to the LAPD, homicide detectives traveled to Rutherford College, North Carolina, and interviewed Hyatt on the 8th of March, 2019 where Hyatt confessed to murdering Barry Crane. The Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office charged Hyatt with one count of murder with a special allegation that he used a deadly and dangerous weapon during the commission of the crime. And they also issued an arrest warrant on the 3rd of May. The motive was not found, but if Hyatt was found guilty, he could face the maximum sentence of life imprisonment. Edwin Hyatt was later arrested by the FBI Fugitive Task Force on the 9th of May 2019 in North Carolina for the murder of Barry Crane. From there, he was moved to California. As Hyatt was led out of a sheriff's station in May 2019, he told reporters that he had been living in Burke County, North Carolina, and working at a Mercedes-Benz auto shop in neighboring Caldwell County. When asked about details of the case, Hyatt replied that he had no memory of that day, and even of that time. He said that he had only bits and broken pieces of memory, which too could only be brought back by suggestions. He didn't even remember Barry when he saw his photograph, but later recognized him after the officers mentioned Barry's name. When the reporters gathered around Hyatt while he was being taken to court, he answered that he is trying his best to pass through that phase. On further interrogation, Hyatt confessed that killing Barry was very possible back then as he was addicted to drugs during that time. He would have been 18 years old when Barry was killed in his apartment. Even though Hyatt had a terrible and chaotic past, his co-workers mentioned Hyatt as a generous man. At the time of his arrest, Hyatt was working at Second Chance Engine Repair, a car repair shop in Rutherford College, North Carolina. He was described as a very humble and generous person by all of his co-workers. A co-worker, Jason Smith, said that Hyatt used to share his small earnings with him and even compared Hyatt to a father. He continued to say that Hyatt had known him for just two or three days and had earned $40 and still shared half of it with him. Another co-worker, D. Hall, told the investigators that Hyatt was very polite and he would never even hurt a fly. The most interesting part of the interrogation that the police had with Hyatt's co-worker, D. Hall, was that when she was asked about Barry Crane's murder, she hesitated to speak up, and Hall ended up saying that she had nothing to say about it. She said that even if it was a homicide, it might have been self-defense from Hyatt's side and the story should be told only by Hyatt and not by any of them. Hyatt believed that whatever he was back then, he was nothing like that now, over 30 years later. He believed that everything was left in the past which he didn't even remember, and that he had changed into a completely different man. His co-workers had the same belief and said that whatever happened, happened 30 years ago, and he was different now. From Hyatt's friend Ernest Ward, it was understood that Hyatt started believing in Jesus and helped everyone in the name of Jesus. Ward said that Hyatt had shared his past drug and drinking problems and that he was glad to be delivered by God. 
He believed that Hyatt had faced horrible demons in his past, and he needed someone to be with him, and Ward accepted that role. It was initially unsure if Hyatt had a lawyer. When asked about anything more or reasons for the killing, Hyatt denied to speak before he got a lawyer. He was appointed a lawyer, Stephen Chevron, who defended him for his court appearances. And on his first court appearance on Friday of May 9th, 2019, Hyatt was using a wheelchair and spoke in a mumble. The court session was dismissed as a result of a plea agreement with the district attorney's office. The court decided on setting the next date for the proceeding, and the 7th of June, 2019 was selected. Till then, Hyatt had to be held in custody without bail. Joshua Smart took over from Stephen Chevron as Hyatt's attorney and was to defend Hyatt in the upcoming proceedings. According to Joshua, Hyatt was obviously willing to take responsibility and was a religious man. It was concluded that if the prosecutors didn't find any evidence by early August, Hyatt would be released from jail. During his time at Morgantown Jail in West Virginia, Hyatt started holding Bible study groups, and one of his friends from North Carolina, Ernest Ward, said that Hyatt had become a devout Christian and had been praying to be free from that phase. On the 5th of August, 2019, Hyatt was served with the governor's warrant which ordered he be extradited to California. Hyatt was then extradited to Los Angeles, California on the 15th of August, 2019. On October 8, 2019, Hyatt appeared in the Van Nuys Courthouse in Los Angeles and was charged with one count of murder to which Hyatt pleaded not guilty. Deputy District Attorney Beth Silverman of the Major Crimes Unit became the prosecutor of the case. According to the law, if Hyatt was found guilty, he would have to serve the maximum sentence of life imprisonment in jail. Hyatt was scheduled to appear in court on the 17th of December 2019, and on October 7th of 2021, Hyatt pleaded guilty to voluntary manslaughter of Barry Crane. Hyatt was sentenced to 12 years of imprisonment. The most interesting part of this case is is that not a single motive could be gathered as to why Hyatt killed Barry. Even though there was no conclusion on the reason for murder, there were many theories. Some theories suggested that Hyatt just wanted drug money and didn't care what he had to do for it, or if he was picked up by someone back then as an escort, and it was Barry who did that. There is a theory that Barry was homosexual and wanted to take advantage of the 18-year-old Hyatt. Many believe that is the only explanation to this as Barry had nothing in common with Hyatt and he had no reason to welcome Hyatt to his apartment. Another theory says that Barry was a very cautious man and would never pick up someone he didn't know. So Crane must have known Hyatt and maybe they had a relationship unknown to others. And more importantly, it was confidential. But it is believed that although Barry was closeted, he was homosexual and Los Angeles gave him the freedom that he needed. In a 2017 article, Michael Bertzold explained that though Barry was discreet and not vocal about his lifestyle, his contemporaries in Hollywood and in Bridge knew he was homosexual. So this might actually support the theory of the incident that day. Another theory explained that Barry's reports and search were kept to a minimum because he was homosexual and it was a big deal during that time. The AIDS epidemic also struck the nation during that time, and gay men were the most affected by AIDS. So it was believed that Barry's case was not taken seriously for so long because of that prejudice. Another source of speculation centered on Barry's imminent plans to disinherit his children. According to the source, Barry had an appointment with his business manager regarding his will. The late Bill Melander, a Michigan physician who played against Crane in his Detroit days and treated his mother, learned that Crane's son Ben owed money to Las Vegas gamblers. And after learning about Barry's plan on changing his will, Barry's son planned on the murder. Although Hyatt was arrested and eventually pleaded guilty, the motive of the murder still remains unsolved. The case might have been simple from the evidence first collected, but the colder the case gets, the harder it becomes to solve, and this case was no different. 
nothing can be perfectly concluded for now. It's almost clear that Hyatt had something to do with the murder, but the case was made confidential after 2019, and there's nothing to say for certain, and that's what made it the longest-running cold case in the Hollywood industry. Barry Crane lived a life of the rich and shown during his days, dominating the game of bridge and engraving his name in the television industry. But ultimately, his $900,000 net worth and luxurious life came to a sudden end, and we hope he now rests in his grave in Mount Sinai Memorial Park in Hollywood Hills. So what are your thoughts on this cold case? Was Hyatt the killer, or was it just self-defense? And what could have been the motive behind the case? Share your opinions in the comment section. And don't forget to like, comment, and share this video. Please subscribe to our channel, where we will bring you more cold cases and discuss everything in detail with you. Stay tuned to Cold Case Files.